Hello, Hi Rock. Welcome to our daily devotional. We're continuing with our exploration of the fruits of the Spirit, continuing today, this week, with uh, gentleness. And we are looking in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 2 and 7 through 9, and the ways that Jesus' common humanity with us gives him and a special gives him a special ability to be gentle with us. So we're in Hebrews chapter 5, 1 through 2 and 7 through 9, where we read the following. Every high priest is a man chosen to represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifice for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, um, here we have uh, Jesus. Uh, he, first of all, understands our weaknesses. And in the previous chapter, the end of the previous chapter, um, the verses immediately preceding this, it talks about how he uh, is, a, you know, he suffered temptation in every way, just as us, yet without sin. But here he it's, it's goes a little bit further than that, I think, in saying that he understands our weaknesses. He's able to deal gently, just like any high priest is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people. That That's us because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. And so Jesus understands these challenges that we face in the, the, the uh, ending verses I um, we, we just read through. Um, he understands also the idea of being trained in something, learning something that is difficult, something that is hard. This is a hard process for us, and Jesus has gone through it as well. It says that Jesus learned obedience. Verse 8, even though he was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Um, just as a context for why this passage really uh, speaks to me, it seems like in every age and um, every theology, there, there tends to be either a greater emphasis on Jesus's divinity or an emphasis on Jesus's humanity. And in evangelicalism and other traditions, we have tended to emphasize the divinity of Jesus much more than his humanity. In postmodern theology, uh, the Jesus's humanity is much more emphasized. And it creates, either way, it creates certain blind spots. And I'm remembering when The Last Temptation of Christ uh, came out. Uh, it was a movie uh, directed by Martin Scorsese based off the book by uh, Nico Kazantzakis. Uh, and in the book and in the movie, while on the cross, Jesus has some kind of uh, vision or hallucination. And in essence, while on the cross, he gets to see what it would have been like for him if he had said yes to a normal life rather than choosing the path of the cross. You know, if he chose to marry and have children and lead a normal life with all of the joys and sorrows that we associate with that kind of life. Uh, and that's the essence of the movie. And, and even there, Jesus ultimately rejects that temptation, um, which is why the movie is called The Last Temptation of Christ. And it affirms his choice to die on the cross. Now, there are definitely weaknesses in this movie and the story, but in that central point, I don't think there's anything really to become upset about. Like, why would it be so strange? Why would it be such a problem to imagine that Jesus might have been tempted by the wholesome joys of this life? Uh, in fact, wouldn't that temptation itself make his desire, you know, his um, decision to sacrifice himself on the cross even that much more praiseworthy? Uh, but, you know, people went nuts when this movie came out. And I remember in upstate New York, one particular instance, uh, there were a lot of protests in different places. But in upstate New York, one person decided to go a step further. They they grabbed a bus and drove the bus into a movie theater that was uh, showing this movie. And this is just crazy. Um, but I think that, you know, those who reject any kind of real dimension to Jesus's humanity uh, forget that. Um, you know, forget that uh, Hebrews, this book that we're reading from, which is, you know, probably amongst all books is one that elevates Christ to such incredible heights. We forget that um, Jesus suffered from our weaknesses and temptations without giving into sin. And because of this, he's able to truly understand and empathize with us. In verse two, it says he's able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses like any good high priest. Um, now, I became a Christian in a church that really emphasized uh, 
the part of the church that emphasized the divinity of Jesus. And I hold on to that truth tenaciously. Uh, I don't think there's anything to let go in that. But I have grown over time to uh, no longer be offended by attempts to really wrestle with and embrace the humanity and appreciate the humanity, full humanity of Jesus. I've come to appreciate these things and and to hold the two in tension that I don't want to, you know, sacrifice either one uh, for the sake of the other. And I don't want to be like G.K. Chesterton talked about, come up, you know, try to meld the two into one kind of mishmash, like mashed potatoes or something like that. It doesn't do either one of them uh, justice. So in any case, I think uh, this verse really speaks to me and how Jesus has this dimension of humanity, fully experienced this dimension of humanity that includes not only temptation, but our very weaknesses. And because of that, is able to be gentle with us, even when we are wayward people, which is uh, always. Dave, I'm wondering what you see in this passage, and maybe what are some of the ways that you appreciate the humanity of Jesus in relating to us? You know, we I had mentioned earlier, and I can't remember, was it Monday or Tuesday? I've forgotten which one. Um, that one way to understand toxic masculinity, I, in my sermon um, that uh, I gave in Arlington last Sunday and um, this coming Sunday in Metro West in Cambridge uh, and online, the uh, I, I talked about the fact that um, I had felt for many years like uh, masculinity was not welcome in, in a lot of the church settings I was a part of. Um, and, and that I think that in part, that's a an overreaction to something that's actually very important. It, it to something that really needs to have some kind of reaction, uh, because we, what we've seen in a lot of circumstances, both in the church and in our culture, is this toxic masculinity, and that's of course a phrase that makes a lot of people roll their eyes eyes these days. Um, and but it makes just as many people go, kind of, "Yes, finally, we're admitting it's real. It is real." Um, and and I think w- the way I talked about toxic masculinity the other day was it was. It was um, strength without empathy, right? Or with insufficient empathy. And and so you end up kind of losing the connection to people. Uh, you know, it, it ends up becoming so goal-oriented that you actually forget the people who are affected by it. Uh, and you, you just lose the tenderness for their humanity. Uh, and I think that's what ends up being toxic masculinity. Masculinity by itself is actually, I think, a, a, a gift from God that's a part of reflecting the image of God. Uh, and and then femininity, right, is is another part of reflecting the image of God. And uh, and what we see in Jesus, and why are we surprised by this, right? I mean, he's the he is the perfect image of God. God said, let us make man in our image, male and female, he created them. And so the only way to image God with humans, none of us can adequately reflect God, it was to have two of us that were different and in relationship, right? And that's kind of the, the two and the relationship were all key in, in that equation. Um, but in Jesus, all of this, like the fullness, Colossians says, the fullness of the image of God res- resides in Jesus. And so he is the perfect balance of masculinity and femininity, right? He contains both pieces in himself. And so we see in him both the, the kind of assertive, uh, got goal-oriented strength that you know we associate sometimes with masculinity, and we see the, the genuine care for people that we associate with the best of femininity, and and that's where I, what I see in this passage is Jesus comes not to discover what it's like to be human. Jesus comes to show us what it's like to be human. Right, he, he's actually going to say, "Okay, I'm going to actually do this the right way. I, I'm going to experience the world the, the right way, the healthiest way, the holiest way, connected to God, walking in faith, uh, you know, believing in the, the this promises for the future, enduring the challenges. I'm going to show you how to do all of this, and I invite you to follow me. Do it like this. I'm showing you this pathway that leads to life instead of leading to destruction. So Jesus is this the true human. So part of it, he comes to show us the way." But the other part of it is, is he comes to show us who God is, right? He's the visible image of the invisible God. And because of Jesus, we know that God knows what it's like to be us. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to be tempted. You know, and we just kind of, it's so impossible to imagine that God could ever relate to me or that I could ever go talk to God about any of these things because they're so, so shameful. God 
God must be like, what, what is this guy, David? I can't believe he's struggling with this. What a, you know, dolt. And, and yet the reality is, no, no, he, he was there. He does get it. He gets it not just because he's omniscient, right? He doesn't just get it in theory. He actually experienced it. He chose to experience that sense of, of, of uh, vulnerability and of, uh, of temptation and of desire and all, all of this thing, right? No temptation has seized you beyond what is common to humanity, Paul's going to write uh, in, in 1 Corinthians. And, you know, all of these things that I experience, that's the stuff that every human experiences. And it's the stuff that Jesus experienced. He himself experienced all of these temptations. And seeing that, that's, again, I, I want to emphasize, Jesus didn't learn what it's like, so now he can really care for us. Like, oh, wow, I really get it. You guys, this is hard. I got it now. No, the whole point is he wants us to see that he sees, know that he knows, so we can go to him without this fear and go, okay, I'm praying not only to a God who can help, but to a God who cares and a God who understands, a God who, who, who will receive me and as it says, he'll deal gently with ignorant, wayward people like us, because he himself is subject to the same weakness. He gets it. Uh, I think that's the the uh, the real beauty that we see in Jesus. Uh, speaking on a the, this kind of idea, like sometimes we think that because Jesus had the strength to not give into these weaknesses, that he must therefore not truly understand us. And C.S. Lewis uh, used, I thought, a great example. He said, you know, you had. Uh, France fell in like two weeks uh, to the power of the German war machine. Britain resisted to the end and then continued to fight. So like which of the two nations truly understood the power of the German war machine in World War II? Well, it was not the French who had to surrender in two weeks. It was the, the British who endured the entire battle for Britain and Dunkirk and everything else. They experienced the full might. So France didn't get the opportunity to experience the full might because they collapsed before that point. And in a similar way, uh, uh, C.S. Lewis said, Jesus alone understands the full force of temptation because we all give in long before temptation has reached its full force, whereas Jesus was the one, only one, who's resisted its full force. So he understands, he gets it in a way that actually we don't even get it and knows how weak we are in its face. So in that way, Jesus even though Jesus has resisted everything, still maybe understands uh, what we face even better than we do. Yeah, amen to that. That's beautiful. Hmm. Well, uh, given that, uh, Dave, would you close us in prayer and, and that we might have a greater appreciation for how Jesus understands us? Right, let's pray together. Lord, we come before you as our great high priest, knowing that you welcome us into conversation with you. You you invite us. You will treat us gently because you know who we are. You know what it's like. So God, I pray that just as you are safe, that you will be dangerous. God, I pray that just as you are safe, you will be strong. And that God, you will challenge me and strengthen me and help me grow to become more like you. God, I am weak in the face of so many temptations, and yet you have the supernatural strength to resist it all. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be in me, and not just for me. God, I pray for all of us who, who are, are doing this devotion together today, God, who are praying together today. God, I pray that you would give us your strength, that we could follow you, not just into eternal life, but into a triumphant kind of life, a life that is able to say no to temptation and say yes to your invitations every single day. God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be in us, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, um, everyone, thank you for joining us. And just two quick notes uh, based on the fact that we have come to the end of uh, unofficial summer. Uh, two things that that means. One, we're uh, going to this Friday, we will have our Flashback Friday. And then next week, we will no longer have the Flashback Fridays. We'll be going back to our normal scheduling. Uh, another thing that it means is uh, Monday, it, for, here, for us here in the United States, this is Labor Day. And so that's a holiday. So we will not be coming back on Monday. We will see you again on Tuesday through next Friday. So go and have a great weekend. Uh, see you then.